feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Central Pennsylvania Shrimp Tank brought to you from my studio here in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. Yes, the metropolis of Dillsburg. I'm your host today, Nathan Imboden, and we're continuing our series called In the Crosshairs of Corona, relevant stories about our business owners here in Central PA and what they're having to deal with given this COVID crisis and shutdown and stay at home orders and all that stuff. Look, Make sure to go to our website at shrimptankpodcast.com slash central PA to see all of the episodes we've done both pre and now during this uh, special series and like our Facebook page, go to your favorite podcast app to subscribe and keep up to date with all the information that we are bringing to you. And today we've got a special guest, a favorite of mine, Mr. Scott Singer, who has Level Up Wellness and, let me get this right, Performance and Recovery. And, um, you know, he's going through an interesting model. He had a, a little bit of a shift in his business model, literally, pretty much right as the shutdown orders happen. And so we wanted to bring this story to you because it gives a very unique perspective on what the realities of putting it all on the line, taking risks, trying to be a long-term thinker, um, and, you know, how these kinds of, of shutdowns really can impact some of those decisions. So I'm not the expert in what's going on in his life. Scott is. So why don't we bring him on now? Scott, welcome to the show. Your Shrimp Tank debut, buddy. I'm glad to have you. Hey, love it, Nathan. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I, I wish we weren't having to have this conversation, but I really appreciate you guys having, having me on. So give us just maybe a little bit of a background on what business was looking like pre-shutdown, pre, you know, March, whatever date it was, mid to late March, where the orders were, you're non-essential, boom, you got to shut down. So give us an idea what that looked like. And then the shutdown happens. And now what business looks like for you? Yeah. So the crazy part for me is that uh, I was actually on vacation down in uh, Florida, down in Tampa. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, for the last six years, I've been doing basically on court basketball skill development, an individual basis, um, uh, but being partner in um, a fitness uh, business and everything as well. And my wife and I had just made the decision that we wanted to expand also into the wellness and the recovery. Uh, and we thought it was like the next logical progression for the now almost 20 years that I've spent in this, uh, in this industry. And, um, you know, we made the investment to bring in an infrared sauna, which we can talk about the benefits of that. We made the investment to bring in uh, compression boots and sleeves from circulation to improve circulation and recovery and things of that nature. And uh, we already made that investment and I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in Florida. Uh, I get confirmation that the sauna is shipped and is on okay. its way. And um, literally we get, the fact that we're, we're being, you know, shut down. It, it, it all really happened. This was early March. Right. And it was literally breaking every single day was something, you know, kind of going on. And, uh, and then, you know, get the word that we're basically shut down as, as non-essential. Um, you know, so since that day, we haven't been able to, you know, conduct any business um, at all. And we are now sitting here <laughs> yeah. that, uh, uh, equipment and with that investment and just uh, making plans for what we're going to do when hopefully we can start, um, you know, taking clients back, you know, back in again. So wait, you're telling me I can't get virtual infrared sauna therapy? Well, I can send uh, like infrared lights through your, <laughs> through the screen, right? Like, yeah. uh, it, it, again, all these tech, Technology. We, we've learned through this that we can do a lot via video. That's right. not going to be what we're going to be able to do. <laughs> yeah. Good call. Good call. Well, and, and that's the reality, right? So there are, uh, there are a lot of businesses that can figure out, they can adapt, right. right? They can say, all right, well, we can shift our business model a little bit to go virtual. But the industries and the businesses that are getting hit the hardest are the ones that really either heavily rely on or have to do business face-to-face, -face, in person, through that interaction. And that's exactly, you know, you talk about your on-the-court training for your basketball, the infrared stuff. I mean, yeah, you could do nutrition training and some of that stuff virtually, but 
a big part of your business can't function that way. So, so talk a little bit about, I mean, you, you had, you said you guys had um, uh, recently done this shift, but you locked yourselves into a pretty long lease, kind of putting it all on the line for moving into this business model, right? Yeah, right. So we had uh, February 1, <laughs> signed <laughs> a, uh, a five-year lease, um, which was going to then, like I said, house both the you know, fitness center as well as the wellness um, uh, center. And uh, of course, all, you know, like I said, all of, all of this went down in, in, early, um, in, in early March. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, March, at least in February, we were still doing some business, but basically, you know, for March and April, and I should say March's, April's, and now May's rent having come yeah. in, coming due. Yeah. And that's, you know, with no revenue. And that's really the tough part. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to touch on that a little bit. I'm kind of throwing one out there to you well, that we didn't touch on ahead of time. And this is not, well, I'm just going to ask a question. Your rent, even though you can't function, is still due and, and payable, correct? Yeah, it is. I mean, I haven't, I haven't reached out. I know people are, you know, being encouraged to kind of reach out to their landlords and stuff like that. I, I, I haven't reached out to them yet in terms of any I don't want to say uh, abatement because I wouldn't expect it to go away, but you know any um, you know delay or anything like that until yeah. we can, until we can get um, open. Yeah. Uh, the unfortunate part for somebody who's self-employed uh, like myself and doesn't have payroll is a lot of the PPP stuff and everything like that was really designed to keep you know people employed mm -hmm. and being able to pay them, mm -hmm. um, but for a self-employed person that stuff really didn't apply to me right um and it wasn't until about two weeks ago i think that they finally came up with uh, i think they call it pandemic unemployment yeah assistance. pua yeah, yeah the pua which uh, you know we've applied for but we haven't heard anything back on that yeah. and who knows how long that'll be well good news in about 13 weeks you'll get a response <laughs> and you know by then you should be just fine right exactly yeah. exactly well, that's interesting. I mean, I've been saying that all along with the PPP loans because you have, you have the, it is designed to keep people employed. However, when you're in a state where we have in Pennsylvania have had some of the most drastic shutdown orders, non-essential business definitions and whatnot, the people that are trying to apply for those loans, that's great if they get them, except if they can't function, if they can't operate, then literally all they're doing is paying their employees to not work, which essentially is just a fancier way of saying, well, here's, instead of going on unemployment, we're going to allow you to pay your employees through this system because they still can't work, but we're still going to pay them through this, which is just a, a messed up system to begin with. But I wanted to ask about the lease payments because it's a reality. And I am, I admire the fact, and we haven't, we haven't gone back to try to renegotiate on our lease you know it's just it's unfortunately it's it's a reality that we face look we can't we can't be in there but the re other reality is the landlord still has his bills that he has right. to pay and yeah. still has all that you know that doesn't go away for him and he's not losing that and you, you just thinking through the trickle down it's not just me if it impacts him and then he's got to go into his pocket and he has all these other things that he has to do that gets impacted it's 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 more global than just well, I shouldn't have to pay my rent because I'm not allowed to be in my building. And so good for you for not, I'd say not saying anything at this point. And I think there's maybe some level of being able to have a landlord come in and say, well, look, because you couldn't literally couldn't be here, maybe I'll, you know, grant some forgiveness and then there may be some dialogue there. But, um, you know, I, I, again, wanted to highlight the reality of the trickle down. It doesn't just impact you. The landlord's impacted, the, you know, somebody's going to be impacted by it. For sure. All right. So, so talk about it. you said pretty much for these last eight weeks, nothing's happened, right? You can't, couldn't really do anything. Um, what, um, what do you see kind of as the future for for you guys? And I don't know. I mean, especially in Pennsylvania. Now, you said there's uh, your daughter, right, who is heading up uh, and uh, is helping with her business to take care of a lot of the nutritional uh, side of things and the recovery, maybe as well. And she's based in Tampa. 
Correct. which is less restrictive. They're opening up things right now. Restaurants are starting to open back up. There's a lot of that. So, so talk about talk about that. With that, what you see the future maybe looking like? Uh, stuff to say in Pennsylvania when you'll be able to actually reopen and engage. But give us give us some, maybe your thoughts around that. Yeah. So you know the the, uh, the the big question with this whole thing, right? Is like when when can we reopen? When can we? It, it, um, get back to doing business and when we can, what will that ultimately look like? Yeah. Um, so what we're trying to do, and, and I would make, I would make the argument that because of the one-on-one -on -one nature of what I did with people anyway, um, that we could have done that and stayed well within the CDC guidelines anyhow. Yeah. Um, and that being said, that's what we're trying to do right now during this time. Okay. Is uh, let's go to the, basketball on court stuff for a moment. It, uh, if I were to, to have, uh, to, to be able to open that back up, uh, it would be one person in one person out. Yep. Pick up drop off. I wouldn't even allow the parents in, right. Just have the, have the player come in. Normally I supplied the basketballs and stuff like that, but I would ask them to bring their own basketball. So it's not a community ball that we're, you know, sharing from client, from client to client. Yep. Would obviously sanitize the hands before the set, you know, and, and after, and I don't need to be within six feet of them to give them their instruction, to give yeah. them a demonstration and to give them their feedback. Yeah. Um, so I think we can maintain the social distancing guidelines. I think we can maintain the, you know, the hand washing and sanitation guidelines um, all while, you know, allowing, you know, these young people are, all of our lives have been disrupted, but, you know, in, in some of the cases that I literally had players that were in the middle of the state playoffs that just got truncated, yeah. uh, you know, and said, okay, we're no longer playing anymore. Uh, you're no longer going to school. You're no longer seeing your friends, you're no longer working, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of them are, you know, starting to take a, a toll on them. You know, there, there's a physical toll, there's a mental toll that, yeah. that all of this is doing as well. So we're trying to put those type of things in place, um, including we're getting one of the, you know, thermal temperature things mm -hmm. that take their temp upon coming in or whatever and, yep. and, uh, and all that. And we really, I really believe that I can do that in as safe or safer environment than almost any other thing that they're doing, that they're doing right now outside. If they're going yeah. to, whether it's Costco, Target, pumping gas, oh, doesn't really it yeah. doesn't really matter. I think that we can do it in a, in virtually the most safe environment that they could possibly be in while being around, you know, you know, another person. Yeah. So we're also then trying to take that into the, into the fitness and the, and the strength training models as well. So what we have been doing is kind of going in and, and we, we're, we're going to move to a pod system. And what I mean by that is we're actually going to say, this space is yours. Okay. This is yours. So if I have 3,500 square feet, and I'll say 10, just because I think that ultimately when we do open up, it, it'll still be, it has to be 10 or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's not even our plan. Our plan is maybe three or five. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Let's say 10 for ease of math, that if we have 3,500 square feet of, of dedicated fitness space and we have 10 people in and we put them into this pod type format, each person has about 350 square feet to themselves. Right. A lot of space. for. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of space. And then in, in doing the pod, we're basically going to have, we'll, we'll have set up. So we're going to schedule them on the hour. Well, it'll be an hour workout, but there'll be 15 minutes between when one group leaves and that. And so that's going to give us the time to wipe down and clean and everything else and prepare mm -hmm. for the next group to come in. And they don't even need to be passing each other like ships in the night, right? We can get yeah. one group out before the next group comes in. Um, uh, and, and everything. So again, we believe that we're in a position now to, again, very safely and effectively do this. Uh, now, the fitness has been something that there, obviously there's been a million things that people can do online and do at home, but not everybody mm -hmm. has the equipment. Mm -hmm. And the reality is when you're at home, your kids are also at home, right? All your right. kids are at school, you're trying to homeschool them, you're, you know, you have all those kind of things to do. So while the capability to do it at home is there and online is, is there, not necessarily the easiest thing to do, you know, for a lot of yeah. people, whether they're business professional, you know, whatever it is, being able to schedule that kind of hour to themselves um, without all the uh, being tagged in so many other directions 
is, is important. And we also believe that there is a value, a motivational value and other things to be able to work with other people, right? To have that social interaction, that, yeah. that tribe kind of feeling, you know, that, hey, these are my, you know, th these are my Monday at 5.30, you know, yeah. people or whatever. Right. And, uh, and you can't, you know, that's something that you can't do, right. you know, virtually. You right. Know? Oh, yeah. E well, even if you have a virtual coach, mm -hmm. uh, how easy is it to, if your coach is trying to check in with you, right? How, how easy is it to see your phone and just hit, nope, and, right. and you know, whatever, yeah, right. that you, you avoid that kind of accountability. But when you're committing to something face-to-face, -face, in person, yeah, absolutely. And uh, what you just said, f from my perspective, was just, it was, it was brilliant, it was sensible, it was rational, and you're 100% correct that you as a business owner, and this has been, I think, the message that most small businesses have been pushing out. Look, we're only, we by nature have a limited number of people that are coming in and out of our facilities, we have a limited number of people that we're interacting with. We can keep our areas up to code way better than Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart that have still droves of people flooding in there, bringing in who knows what. I'm glad you're wearing a mask, but that doesn't cover your feet and your clothing and all the other stuff that you've got around. You know, you're you're just bringing stuff into that system. You can't tell me that they sanitize better than Scott Singer could in his facility. And so I'm hopeful that we're starting to get to that reality where the where our government will say, yeah, OK, you can do that. Yeah, maybe for a long time we won't see packed concert venues and you know that kind of stuff, which right. is a different story. But when we're talking about your livelihood and being able to continue to uh, move things along safely, it's just rational. I mean, what you just said and described was 100% rational, and I hope um, I hope our government will continue to see that. One thing we have to keep in mind: I've been saying this to people as well is. We're living Pennsylvania's rules and regulations, but that's not the rest of the country either. So fortunately, a lot of other areas in our country are not as restrictive. If you had been operating in Tampa, you may be able to be doing what you're doing, or you may be able to be doing what you had talked about doing because the restrictions are a little bit lighter and whatnot. But uh, you know what? It is what it is. We'll get through it. We'll figure out how to get through it. We just hope it doesn't take too long. Yeah, correct. And, you know, and, and I want to, I want to be a hundred percent sure, uh, you know, clear in saying we do not want to put anybody in, in harm's way right. with our clients and certainly ourselves, you know, I don't want to get something, bring it home to my wife or, you know, a, a, anything else. Um, so I'm not discounting that, but I think hopefully through my answer, you see that we have put the steps in place. We can't eliminate the risk, but we can right. mitigate it. Right. And, and then the other final thing I'd like to say, especially in terms of my like basketball clients, is that, um, and this is coming from Pennsylvania Department of Health's own website, is that the age group of 13 to 18, which is one of their groupings, which is my sweet spot, um, has 1% uh, of the confirmed cases of the whatever we're at now, 40 some thousand confirmed yeah. cases, There's like 1% of the confirmed cases. So that that age group that demographic is is either not getting it <laughs> or getting it and being asymptomatic right, right. for the most part uh, so right. they're not getting tested um and we and we totally understand that you can be asymptomatic and still pass that on so you have to be careful with those things which is why we talked about the temporal thermometer you know and, and right. you know and, and doing all that you know that kind of stuff um and and still trying to take those precautions. So we take it very seriously is my, is my yeah. point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, why don't we talk about one other quick topic before we close out? It was something we got into a little bit of a dialogue earlier about kind of a lesson that this uh, pandemic, the, the COVID crisis has brought out with relation to health, wellness. Um, you know, we've seen that the people who are at most risk are the ones that have had multiple, either certain underlying conditions, in most cases, multiple underlying conditions. And so why don't you maybe just touch briefly on that, on the importance, because it's a message, you know, that I think the fact that you had started to go down that road of wellness, nutrition, uh, and then this happens is a, a good caveat for um, promoting that 
level uh, type of lifestyle. So touch on that for a little bit, your viewpoint, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. So um, a, a story for a no topic for another day, but I've been going through my own kind of um, uh, journey the last two years where through the idea of nutrition and kind of eliminating well uh, inflammation that was mm -hmm. causing me a lot of joint pain when I was training and so forth and so on. And, and I was, I was able to, in essence, um, uh, eliminate that joint pain and all of my blood biomarkers and everything kind of, you know, improving. And I was like, wow, you know, this is something, and particularly I think some cases, you know, for men, I think a lot of times we take less good care of ourselves um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but you start looking and saying, you know, a lot of the things that we're impacted with are lifestyle related things. So if we start talking about the two biggest underlying things that uh, besides age, just age, um, the two biggest underlying health conditions that um, led people to have worse outcomes through this, and it's not just the United States, thing, it's been all throughout, um, is like I said, is, are these underlying um, health issues the two most prominent being hypertension and uh, diabetes, type two mm -hmm. diabetes. Yeah. For the most part, those can be controlled. You mm -hmm. know, those are lifestyle related things. So we were already going down this, this path, you know, I just had my 60th birthday and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it may have something to do with where I am in my, you know, life right now and everything else. But we already started going down this path that said, you know, we need to take better care of ourselves as a society, you know, as, as a society, these things can be easily um, eliminated and reduced for a lot of people. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I believe that there's policy issues, there's healthcare policy issues and other stuff like that, that, that this did before the pandemic. Yeah. With the pandemic though, I think the message is even clearer. Right. So, I'm a person that like after the first like hand wringing and oh, this is being done to me in terms of, you know, having to shut down and just not having control, you know, yeah. and all that kind of stuff is like, okay, well, what can we do? And we started talking about this concept of forging our internal armor, right? Which is basically our immune system, our, our, our well-being from the inside. So not just how we look <laughs> on the outside, right. but really taking care of ourselves on the inside. And so we were going down that path and, and I really believe, and I'm hopeful, let's put it this way, that when we do return to normal, that that message is going to be um, even more well received uh, as a result of this, you know, yeah. and the statistics are like, you can't argue with the statistics. I don't oh care what gosh. side of the aisle you're on or exactly. any, anything else. You can't argue the statistics are the statistics yep. and the predominance of the deaths um you know has really been with people number one older that's the biggest factor but then with the underlying health conditions right yeah. Yeah. and uh and, and we can help people with that you know yeah. we can help them through their journey through that i've done it the last two years and and uh you know we can help them with that journey yeah awesome well and i'm i'm with you i'm hopeful that message sticks and doesn't become uh you know a a fad. It's not like a diet way where people, uh, January 1, they say, I'm going to start eating better. And by uh, even in the fitness world, I think they call it the fitness plateau, which is in the middle of February, then when everybody right. seems to fall off the map. Right. Hopefully it's not not one of those, but is a longer term lifestyle change that, that a lot of people will make. And um, if it is, you guys will be a big part of it. So I'm looking forward to that for, for you guys and enduring that. So, hey, Scott, Thanks again, brother. Thanks for coming on the show, sharing your perspective. Again, a great glimpse uh, you've given our viewers on the realities of what entrepreneurs will go through in times like this. So thanks for being a voice, for being reasonable, <clears throat> excuse me, open and willing to share your story. And uh, we just really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure, Nathan. Like I said, really appreciate you guys, um, you know, having us, uh, having us on. Awesome. Well, everybody, again, that was Scott Singer giving his story of really the reality that right now he's kind of truly shut down, can't really operate, can't do anything, but is optimistic about the ability to get back safely. And that's the message that uh, we're continuing to want to push out is that the businesses that we're dealing with and most of the businesses in our area are saying, look, we just want to be able to open up safely. We can follow guidelines. We can do things so that we're not putting people at risk. 
but let's allow us to keep doing that. And so hopefully that message continues to be heard. I know Scott is going to do everything in his power to make sure that is taken care of so that everybody can be safe as they enter their facilities. So uh, again, thanks for tuning in. Go to our website, shrimptankpodcast.com slash central PA to catch all of our previous episodes for uh, the central PA shrimp tank. We'll see you on next week's episode. Thanks. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank, big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank.